Good evening. My name is Michelle Mitra, and as president of Dominican Student Business Association and a Dominican Leadership Ambassador, it is my honor to welcome you here to the university. This program is brought to us tonight by Dominican's Institute for Leadership Studies and Dominican's Honors Program in cooperation with Book Passage. Please join me in thanking Elaine and Bill Petrocelli, owners of Book Passage, for their support. The Institute for Leadership Studies at Dominican University of California serves as one of our university's portals to and from Marin, the Bay Area, and beyond. The Institute is a consortium of faculty and students with business and community leaders committed to providing leadership development opportunities and expanding options for leadership practice. Through this institute, we seek to facilitate positive individual, organizational, and societal change, engage citizenship, and socially responsible leadership. This lecture series is the public face of the Institute. The series brings to Dominican some of the country's leading figures from the world of politics, entertainment, academia, and literature. The series also enables the university to share its wonderful resources with members of its community. In recent years, we have welcomed a variety of personalities. Al Gore, Ralph Nader, Oliver Sacks, Jane Fonda, Madeleine Albright, Bill Bradley, all who have shared with us candid observations about the role of leadership in our society. Tonight, we welcome back to our stage Ms. Isabel Allende, who recently was called a literary legend by Latino Leaders Magazine, which also has her one of the most influential Latino leaders in the world. Here to introduce Ms. Allende is the critically acclaimed author, Mr. Martin Cruz Smith. Mr. Smith's Gorky Park is an international bestseller. Some of his other novels include Polar Star, Stalin's Ghost, Havana Boy, and Rose, of which the latter two won the Hammett Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Martin Cruz Smith. Now, Isabel has asked me to make this introduction short, and considering the state of my voice, it may be. I know it's curious to, uh, you, to be asked to introduce a woman who opened up the Olympic Games. <laughs> this woman does not need uh, much introduction. Isabel Allende is in the world's uh, literary elite, having written such books as House of the Spirits, Infinite Plan, Ava Luna, and uh, what impressed me particularly was Zorro. I was especially impressed when she cut a Z across my chest. Yet her stories are really intimate and inclusive, which often seems to be sort of a, a contradiction because intimate means something quite often withheld and secret. And Isabel does not trade in secrets. Isabel goes and meets the, meets the, uh, meets the world head on. Her new book is a, is a letter to her, her daughter Paula, who is gone but still within listening presence listening distance. It's also a diary of a dangerous passage to places where she's known for magical realism. She goes to places in this book where magical realism or magic of any kind will not reach, where loss and rage cannot be dismissed or ameliorated. Isabel Allende does not move on. She takes the dark as first, a, first an enemy and then a companion. And we become the family. It's quite interesting to me the way she makes, she starts with one person, links to another person, another person. Sometimes that seven points is separation. There is no separation in Isabella Allende's work. She sails where there be monsters. And she names the monsters of family life. The, 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 the inescapable drama that turns to melodrama, that turns to tragedy, that finally ends up somehow in resolution and victory. She goes places and sees things and refuses to close her eyes. She is a real teller of the truth. The truth can be very desperate, very anxious, and far beyond the stuff that uh, uh, most fiction writers, especially adventure or men's adventure magazines or books will dare take us. 
She puts us right in the lion's den of family life. She is our brave captain. Isabel Allende. Thank you so much. Um, this will be a very difficult evening for me because all my family is here, except my grandson who is sleeping at home. He'll pay, he'll pay. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about um, my new book, uh, The Sum of Our Days, a book that was very easy to get into and very difficult to get out of. Uh, it is a family memoir. Um, in 1992, December 6, my daughter Paula died, and um, we were all together, the family was together. We scattered her ashes in Samuel P. Taylor in the woods, and then the grieving started. And my way of grieving was to write a book. I wrote a book called Paula never thinking that that book would have such an impact in my readers. Um, this was 14 years ago, and I have received thousands of letters. I still receive many letters a day, and I would say that 80% of the letters mention Paula. It's not me who is the legend, she is the legend. And she has become this roaming spirit that has touched so many hearts and so many lives. In her name, um, I created a foundation to continue the work that she was doing as a young woman, empowering of women and girls. And um, after that, I went through a period of uh, depression, I suppose if you can call it, and writer's block. And finally, I could start writing again. And then the family started to change. Melodrama started to happen. Melodrama follows me in my life. Two things follow me, melodrama and violence. And I'm always like escaping from both. But eventually you have to confront them, especially family melodrama. Uh, there's nothing wrong with melodrama, you know. Uh, when, me when melodrama is written by a man, it's called tragedy. So uh, on, December, on January 8th, 2006, when I, I start all my books on January 8th, m I was got ready to start a novel placed in the Caribbean, and then the phone rang, so 8 o'clock in the morning. It was my agent in Spain. She always forgets that she's nine hours ahead in time. So she said, read me the first sentence. And I said, Carmen, it's 8 o'clock. I don't have a, f a first sentence. She said, well, then write a memoir. Tell Paula what has happened to the family during all these years. And I said, well, Carmen, I don't, I don't think my family likes to be exposed. And she said, well, a professional writer, if that person needs to choose between the story or hurting somebody in the family, they choose the story. <laughs> and I said, are you completely sure? And she said, yes, totally sure. Okay. So I decided that that was going to be my calling for that year, and I was going to write the story of the family. So I took out of the closet the letters that I write to my mother every day, and at the end of the year, she returns to me. And so based on the letters, looking at the letters, I could recall everything that had happened written the same day that it happened. So later, when the family came to me with their version of the stories, I could say, excuse me, I wrote it, here it is. I said it was easy to get in and difficult to get out because, of course, I was writing about people who were alive and around, around me, the people I love the most in this world, my tribe, my family. I'm very lucky. I don't have a blood-related family. That blood-related family is in Chile, and I don't like them. I don't have to see them. <laughs> I put together a family with the people I love. Except for my son and my grandchildren, we are all blended in somehow. And we come from different cultures and different languages, but we get along and we live in a sort of emotional compound. Um, we, are, we all live within three blocks of each other. We see each other all day. The women work together. We share clothes. You wouldn't believe that you can share my clothes. You can, because they're all cut by us, so they fit everybody. 
And that's how I like to live. I like the tribe. And I, I, I'm just so proud and so happy that I have all these people around me. When I finished the book, I had it translated because I write in Spanish, and I showed it to everybody. And everybody came to me, and it was a wonderful opportunity, not only to go deeper into the story that I had written, but, but also um, get deeper in the, into the, each relationship, get to know each one better. I tend to see the world in terms of stories. Everything for me is a story. And I forget that behind the story, there's a person with feelings, with their own perspective of things. And I'm very disrespectful of that. So in, that, in those conversations, I got to know each one better. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity they gave me to do that. Uh, there's only one person with whom we could not agree on the version that I had written, and I had to take him out of the, of the story. And that's my, one of my stepsons. Um, an observant reader will notice that in the book there is a lot of therapy, a fortune in therapy, many therapists. Now, the reason for the therapy is not in the book. I had to take him out. <clears throat> And now I will, I will, I, I don't know what to choose to, to read from tonight because, because it, the book is like a patchwork of different stories and all together it's a blanket to wrap my house. Uh, so I, I've chosen little things that sort of illustrate what we are as a group. This one is called Searching for a Bride. My son, Nico, had become very handsome. By the way, he's sitting over there, you can take a look. <clears throat> he was wearing his hair long, like an apostle, and his feature had become more accentuated. Large, sultry eyes, aristocratic nose, square chin, elegant hands. It was inexplicable to me that there weren't a dozen women chasing after him. Behind Willie's back, he doesn't understand these things, my friend Tabra and I decided to look for a girlfriend for Nico. In India and many other places in the world, marriages are arranged. There are fewer divorces than in the Western countries, Tabra explained. That doesn't prove that they are happy, only that they have to put up with more, I said. The system works fine. Marrying for love is problematic. It's more successful to unite two compatible persons who with time will learn to love one another, she said. That's a little risky, but I don't have a better idea, I admit it. <laughs> it isn't easy to make these arrangements in California, as she herself had proved for years. None of the matchmaking agencies had found a man that was worth her while. I remember that one year she had 150 dates in a year. Nothing worked. <laughs> in view of the negative results obtained by Tabra, I didn't want to put ads in the newspapers or go to agency. That seemed a little indiscreet in view of the fact that I hadn't as yet consulted Nico. I devoted myself to looking for a potential sweetheart everywhere I went, and in the process, my eye grew sharper. I made inquiries among people I knew. I scrutinized the young women who asked for my autograph in bookstores. I, I even brazenly stopped a pair of girls in the street, but that method was inefficient. At that pace, Nico would be 70 and still a bachelor. I studied women in an I studied women and in the end would discard them for different motives, serious or tedious, talkative or shy, smokers or microbiotic fiends, dressed like my mother or with a tattoo of the Virgin of Guadalupe on their backs. <laughs> this was for my son. That, that choice could not be made frivolously. I was beginning to lose hope when Tabra introduced me to Amanda a photographer and writer who wanted to make a trip to the Amazon with me for a travel magazine. Amanda was very interesting and beautiful, but unfortunately she was married and planned to have children very soon. She wasn't a good candidate for my romantic designs. However, during our conversation, the subject of my son came up. Amanda told me that she knew the ideal girl, Lori Barra. Lori was her best friend, 
She was she had a generous heart, she had no children, she was pretty, refined, a graphic designer from New York who now lived in San Francisco. She had an obnoxious boyfriend, according to Amanda, but would find a way to get rid of him and leave Lori available to meet Nico. <laughs> Not so fast, I said. First, I need to know that girl. Amanda organized a lunch and I took my granddaughter Andrea with me. At that time, she was five. It seemed to me that at least the young designer ought to have a vague idea of what she would be taking on. Of the three children, Andrea was without doubt the most peculiar. <laughs> My granddaughter came dressed like a beggar, with pink rags tied around different parts of her body, a straw hat with faded flowers, and her Save the Tuna doll. I was on the verge of dragging her somewhere to buy a more presentable outfit, but I decided it was best for Lori to know her in her natural state. <laughs> Amanda had said nothing to, to her friend about our plans, nor I to Nico. We didn't want to alarm them. The lunch in the Japanese restaurant was a good strategy. She wanted to meet us only because she loved Tabra's jewelry, and she had read a couple of my books, two points in her favor. Tabra and I were very impressed with her. She was a calm pool of simplicity and charm. Andrea observed her without saying a word as she tried in vain to get pieces of raw fish into her mouth with chopsticks. You don't get to know a person in an hour, Tabra warned me afterward. She's perfect. She even looks like Nico. They're both tall, slim, handsome, have noble bones, and they wear black. They look like twins, I said. Looking like twins isn't the basis of a good marriage. Look, Debra, in India they have horoscopes, and let's say that isn't very scientific either, I answered. We need to know more about her. We have to, to see her in difficult circumstances, she insisted. You mean, you mean like a war? <laughs> well, that would be ideal. But they are all pretty far away. Why don't we invite her to go with us to the Amazon, was Debra's suggestion. And that is how Lori, who had seen us only once over a plate of sushi, ended up flying without to Brazil in the role of assistant to Amanda. The Amazon was the perfect stressful trip we needed. <laughs> we even saw a guy being murdered five feet away from where we were standing, five bullets in the head. Lori survived and passed all the tests. So when we came back, I invited her to have dinner and introduced Nico and the other two children who compared with Andrea seemed bland. I had told Lori that Nico was still angry about his divorce and it would not be easy for him to find a partner since no woman in her right senses would want a, woman, a man with three runny-nosed kids. To Nico, I commented in passing that I had met an ideal woman for him, but since she was older than he was and already had a boyfriend of sorts, we would have to keep looking. I think that's up to me, he replied smiling, but a shadow of panic flashed across his face. During dinner, Lori and Nico did not exchange a single word. They didn't even look at each other. I thought we had fallen we had failed miserably, but a month later, my son confessed to me that he had been out with Lori several times. I can't understand how they kept that from me a whole month. <laughs> Are you in love? I asked. I think that's a little premature, he replied with his habitual caution. Love is never premature, particularly, particularly at your age, Nico. I'm only 30. 30, you say, but it was only yesterday that you were breaking bones on your skateboard and firing eggs at people with your slingshot. The years fly, fly by, my son. There's no time to lose. Years later, Amanda told me that the day after Nico met Lori, my son planted himself at the door of, his, of her office building with a yellow rose in his hand, and when finally she came out to go to lunch and found him standing there like a post in the hot sun, Nico told her that he was just passing by. <laughs> he doesn't know how to lie. His blush betrayed him. Soon, the, ma the man Lori was having an affair with, a rather famous travel photographer, quietly disappeared beyond the horizon. 
She was able to leave him with no sense of guilt when Amanda and other friends took on the task of ridiculing him while praising the real and imaginary virtues of Nico. When she bid the photographer farewell, he told her not to show up at any of the places where they had been together. I remember the moment when Nico and Lori's love was made public. One Saturday, he left the children with us. In their minds, there was nothing better than sleeping with their grandparents and stuffing themselves with sweets and television, and came to pick them up on Sunday morning. One look at his scarlet ears, the color they get when he wants to hide something from me, and it was clear to me that he had spent the night with Lori, and knowing him, that thing, things were getting serious. Three months later, they were living together. As a matchmaker, I'm very proud to say that they have been together for 11 very happy years. <clears throat> and now I'm going to um, read a couple of chapters about Willie and I, mainly Willie. Willie's my husband. It's dark here, but he's sitting there with a hat. <laughs> One of the psychologists, we had several out at, at our disposal, recommended that Willie and I share some activities that were fun, not just obligatory. We needed more lightness and entertainment in our lives. I proposed to my husband that we should take dancing lessons because we'd seen an Australian movie on that theme, Strictly Ballroom. And I could already see us whirling in the glow of crystal chandeliers, Willie in a dinner jacket and two-toned shoes, and I in beaded dress and ostrich plumes. Both of us airy, graceful, moving at the same rhythm, in perfect harmony, as we hoped someday our relationship would be. When we had met that unforgettable day in October 1987, Willie had taken me dancing at a hotel in San Francisco. That gave me the opportunity to bury my nose in his chest and sniff him, and that is why I fell in lust with him. Willie smells like a healthy boy. His only memory of that occasion, however, was that I kept tugging him around. It was like trying to break a wild mare, he told me. It seemed to me that he, it seems that he asked me, is this going to be a problem between us? And he assures me that I answered with a very sweet and submissive voice, of course not. That had been a number of years before. We decided to begin with private lessons as we wouldn't, we wouldn't look ridiculous in front of other more advanced dancers. More accurately, I was the one who made that decision. The truth is that Willie was a good dancer in his youth, fawned over and with a winning record in dance contests, and I, in contrast, had all the grace of a Mack truck on the, on the dance floor. The ballroom of the academy had floor-to-ceiling mirrors and on all four sides, and the teacher turned out to be a 19-year-old Scandinavian with legs as long as I was tall. She was wearing black stockings with seams down the back and stiletto heels. She announced that she would begin, that we would begin by dancing salsa. She pointed me to a chair, fell into Willie's arms, waited for the precise beat of the music to launch herself across the floor. The man leads was her first lesson. Why, I asked. I don't know, but that's the way it is, she said. <laughs> Aha, Willie crowd with triumphant air. That doesn't seem fair to me, I persisted. What's not fair about it, asked the Scandinavian. I think we should take turns. <laughs> Willie will lead once and then it will be my turn. <laughs> the man always leads, the British woman exclaimed. She and my husband glided around the dance floor to a Latin beat as the huge mirrors reflected their interlocked bodies to infinity. The long black stocking clad legs and Willie's idiotic smile. <laughs> while I sat and stewed in my chair. 
After we left the class, we had a fight in the car that came close to ending in fistcuffs. According to Willie, he hadn't even noticed the teacher's legs or her breasts. <laughs> that was all in my mind. Jesus, how stupid can you be? He cried. The fact that I had spent an hour in that chair while he danced was logical, since the man leads. And once he learned, he could guide me around the floor with the perfection of the courting dance of the heron. He didn't put it exactly that way, but to me it sounded as if he was mocking me. My psychologist thought that we should not give up. The ballroom dancing was an effective discipline to the body and the soul. What did he know? A Buddhist green tea drinker who surely had never danced in his life. <laughs> but all the same, we went to a second and third class before I lost patience and punched the instructor. <laughs> I have never felt so humiliated. The result was that what little we knew about dancing, we lost. And since then, Willie and I have gone dancing only once. I'm recounting this episode only because it's like an allegory of our character. It captures every nuance of us from head to toe. And I'm going to end with this chapter called The Perverted Dwarf. We were invited to a cocktail party in San Francisco, and I went reluctantly, only because Willie asked me to. A cocktail party is a terrible trial for someone of my stature, especially in this country of tall people. It would be different in Thailand. <laughs> in high heels, I come up to with a women's breastbone and the men's belly button. The waiters go by with their trays above my head. There's no advantage in being five feet tall, unless that it's easy to pick up things that fall to the floor. <laughs> While Willie, surrounded with admiring women, devoured prawns at the buffet table and told stories of his youth, such as hitchh hitchhiking around the world and sleeping in cemeteries, I dug into a corner so no one would step on me. That evening, a gentleman came toward me and when he looked down, was able to make me out against the pattern of the rug. And from his Anglo-Saxon heights, offered me a glass of wine. Hello, I'm David, pleased to meet you. Isabel, the pleasure is mine, I replied, looking at the glass with apprehension. You can't get red wine stains out of white silk. What do you do? He asked in the spirit of beginning a conversation. That question leads itself to several responses. I could have said that right at that moment, I was silently cursing my husband for having, me, having brought me to that damn party. But I opted for something less philosophical. I am a novelist. Really, how interesting. When I retire, I'm going to write a novel, he said. Ah, is that right? And what is your line of work now? I'm a dentist, and he... <laughs> and he handed me his card. Well, when I retire, I'm going to pull teeth, I replied. <laughs> Anyone could say that writing novels is like planting geraniums. I spend 10 hours a day nailed to a chair, turning sentences over a thousand and one times in order to tell something in the most effective way. I suffer over the plots. I become deeply involved with the characters. I do my research. I study, correct, edit. I revise translations, and in addition, travel the world, promoting my books with the tenacity of a street vendor. In the car, going home, driving over the superb Golden Gate Bridge, bright in the moonlight, I told Willie, laughing like a hyena, what the dentist had said, but my husband didn't see the joke. I'm not planning to wait till I retire. Very soon I'm going to begin writing my own novel, he announced. <laughs> Jesus, can you believe how arrogant some people are? And may I know what your little novel is going to be about? I asked. About an oversexed dwarf.
I thought at first that my husband was beginning to catch up with my Chilean sense of humor, but he actually meant it. A few months later, Willie began to write by hand on lined yellow paper. He went around with his pad under his arm and showed whatever he was writing to anyone who wanted to see it except me. He rode in airplanes, in the kitchen, in bed, while I teased him unmercifully. A depraved dwarf! What a brilliant idea! The irrational optimism that has served Willie so well in his life once more kept him afloat, and he was able to ignore my Chilean, Chilean sarcasm, which is like those tsunamis that erase everything in their path. I thought that his literary seal would evaporate as soon as he found how hard it is to write, but nothing stopped him. He completed an abominable novel in which a frustrated love, a legal case, and the dwarf were intertwined, confusing the reader who couldn't determine whether he was reading a romance, a lawyer's memoir, or a string of repressed adolescent hormonal fantasies. The women friends who read it were very frank with Willie. He should take the bloody dwarf out and maybe he could save the rest of the book, if he rewrote it with more care. The male friends advised him to take out the romance and expand the dwarf's depravation. <laughs> His son Jason told him to take out the romance, the courts, and the dwarf and write a story set in Mexico. <laughs> me, something unexpected happened with me. The dreadful novel increased my admiration for Willie, because in the process I could appreciate more than ever his basic virtues, strength and perseverance. But in truth, his book had too many fundamental problems. Writing is like magic tricks. It isn't enough to pull rabbits from a hat. You have to do it with elegance and in a convincing manner. I reminded Willie that many authors, including Shakespeare, had written pages whose final destination was a trunk. We had several trunks in our home where the dwarf could sleep the sleep of the just indefinitely. <laughs> but Willie ignored everyone's opinion and sent the book to various agents who returned it with courteous but unmistakable rejections. Far from deflating him, those letters of condemnation reinforced his fighting spirit. My husband is not a person to be discouraged by reality. <laughs> One night, embraced in bed, I explained the advantages of writing about something you know. What did he know about sodomite dwarfs? Nothing, unless he was projecting onto that lamentable character some aspect of his own personality that I didn't know about. On the other hand, he had been a lawyer for more than 30 years, and he had a formidable memory for details. Why didn't he explore the genre of the detective novel? Any of the many cases he had tried could serve as a point of departure. Nothing is as entertaining as a gruesome murder. He lay there thinking without saying a word. The next day, he took his yellow pad and started writing again. Two years later, his first mystery novel was published in Spain under the title Duelo in Chinatown, and several other editors bought it to translate it into nine languages. Everywhere he went, the press welcomed him with curiosity and published nice articles because he won everyone over, especially women, with his simplicity. No pretension, only the blue gaze and the dashing smile beneath the brim of his eternal hat. He told everybody about his first book, the oversexed dwarf. And that horrible little character appeared in all the interviews. The male journalists advised him to pay no attention to his wife and publish his first novel because everybody loves perverted dwarfs. It would sell like hotcakes. I have never seen Willie so happy. He just published his second mystery, King of the Bottom, and he's writing his third one. I'm afraid that in this one, he has taken the dwarf out of the trunk. I'm not looking forward to it. But I'm very happy because I will not have to take care of my drooling old man. The same astrologer who once told Willie that his children were his worst enemies also told him that the last 27 years of his life would be very creative. So I can relax until he's 96. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. We can have the lights in the house, then I can take questions. Don't be shy. It's just the family here. <laughs> wow, I know everybody in this room, it's terrible. Who doesn't know me personally here? Two people, three, four. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. It's always a pleasure to hear you Thank speak you so and read your books. Uh, I was wondering if you're planning on writing another historical novel, like Enos of My Soul. I really enjoyed that. And I was wondering if you'd investigated any other uh, heroines in the past that you thought would be interesting to write about. Um, everybody heard, heard the question, no? Yeah. Uh, I love to write historical novels. Because uh, when I research a time and a place, I have the story. The, the rest is just not much work. The, the, the circumstances, the place and the, and, and the time give me so much that it's easy to write the story. Now, when there is a heroine that really existed, like Inés Suárez in the, in the conquest of Chile, it makes it even easier because you have the character. In a way, that happened to me with Zorro. A book that is, of course, Sorrow is a fictional character, but the, the character existed and the time was fascinating, the, the beginning of the 1800s. So putting together a time and a character makes, makes my job as a novelist easier. Uh, and I, I love to write uh, historical fiction. Right now I'm writing a book that is also historical fiction placed in the Caribbean in the beginning of the 1800s. And so I'm researching that time, and it's fascinating. I love it. Yes, come on. First of all, I commiserate with you being five foot, because yeah. I too can't reach. <laughs> um, I was, I, I've read a number of your books and was very interested in Zorro, really enjoyed that. In your introduction, I believe you had said originally you hadn't wanted to write Zorro when you were first approached but, uh, about it. What in fact changed your mind? In, in reading that book, I kept asking myself then, what prompted you to write it? It was so enjoyable. I was asked to write that book by the people who owned the copyright of Zorro. And they said they had done everything with Zorro. They had done coffee mugs and costumes and movies and TV series and everything, but they didn't have a work of literature. And they thought that I, would, I was a good match because I have I live in California, I write in Spanish, I come from the Spanish culture. I had written books, historical fiction, and also I had written books about, uh, for kids uh, with adv adventure stories. Um, so they asked me to do it, and at the beginning I, I thought, what are these people thinking? I'm a serious writer, I don't write on commission. But then I remembered Antonio Banderas in the movies. <laughs> and I think that, that convinced me. So as I was writing the book, I had a photograph of Antonio Banderas there near my computer, which was very inspiring. And I had all kinds of dreams that, um, that Zorro would climb the balcony and uh, spend the night with me, and um, he wouldn't even perceive my cellulite. And, and then the next day, he would disappear at dawn and there would be no guilt. I didn't know who the guy was. He wore a mask. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Isabel. Um, I just wanted to thank you for writing Ines of My Soul because it inspired me to write my thesis on La Malinche. La Malinche, yeah. Yes, and um, I wanted to ask you, in your research of Ines Suarez, um, how long did you take in researching these historical people? Usually it takes me several years to research for a book, so while I'm researching I'm writing other books. It took me seven years to write Daughter of Fortune, but in the meantime I wrote other things. And for this book it took me like five years of research, and I, I did most of it um, in Chile because very little is known about Inés. A lot is known about the conquest and the 110 conquistadors that went to Chile with her. 
but she was never mentioned because she was the lover of Pedro de Valdivia. So when Pedro de Valdivia wrote the letters to the king, he to told the king all his um, feasts and, uh, and, and conquests, and, and he talked about all the conquistadors except her. She's not mentioned. So it was hard to get the information. But then, as I'm writing the book, usually I, I need to fill in information that I didn't know I was going to need. So there is always research going on. I find myself that now I'm writing another historical novel that I'm all the time looking for more information. Sometimes I can Google it, but most of the time I can't. I have to order a book to a university in the East Coast or things like that. Um, so it, it's a never-ending process until you give up at the end. Uh, hi, I have the curiosity to know when do you start writing? Is it easy for you to do it in Spanish or in English? I was born in Quillota. Ah, and Chilena. I, <laughs> sí, and I married a gringo and I've been living here for a long time. <laughs> so I remember the first time that I dreamed in English, I was speaking English. It was amazing for me. Yeah. And I was wondering, it's easy for you when you write your novel, uh, write it in Spanish or in English? Um, I write only in Spanish. I can only write fiction in Spanish, but I can write something that is non-fiction, like an article for a newspaper or a speech in English. All the really organic things in my life, and writing is an organic thing that happens in the womb and not in the mind, um, I do in Spanish, like um, making love. I would feel ridiculous panting in English, uh, <laughs> scolding my grandchildren. All that is in Spanish. But there are other things that now I do automatically in English because I live here. For example, buying the groceries. I know the names now in English, and I have forgotten the names of the groceries in Spanish. Yeah. Um, there are th th certain things that I do in Spanish. I don't dream in English. I don't count in English. I can't pray in English. All that is done in Spanish. Actually, when I came to this country, I spoke very little English. I could read a menu in a restaurant, but I couldn't understand the news on TV. I couldn't go to the movies. I remember being with Willie in the movies, and he would have to whisper in my ear the plot because there was this guy with an ice pick destroying some woman's breasts, and I don't know what the heck was going on. So he had to tell me the plot. Now I understand a little more. Thank, thank you very much. At my old high school, um, every freshman English class was required to read um, your book, The House of Spirits. Oh, nice. And, <laughs> and what we do with the books that we read, of course, we analyze them and we pick them apart. We take every sentence and symbol and try to find a meaning in it. And I just wanted to... I was just wondering what you felt about uh, using your books as teaching tools, teachers picking them to teach students about English and about reading and writing. And I also was wondering how you felt about people taking your books and under-analyzing them or over-analyzing them. Do you think that sometimes people get the wrong meanings of them, or are they completely open to interpretation? You know, I feel very honored that my books are used in some schools and universities and then on book clubs or whatever, I, I feel very honored that they have chosen that book. But I feel even more honored when some church bans my books. <laughs> uh, and that happens quite a lot. Analyzing the books is fine. I feel that as a writer, I tell half of the story and the reader contributes with the other half. Each person reads the book in a different way. They find in the books different things that I didn't mean to, to, to put there. I didn't even know that I was writing about that. I remember when I wrote Daughter of Fortune, I had no idea why I had written that book. What was my connection to the gold rush? None. And then when I went uh, to present the book in Spain, the, the first person who interviewed me was a critic, and he said, this book is about feminism. It is the story of a woman in Victorian times who runs away from the restriction of, and the safety of her home and goes into an all-male environment, the gold rush, and has to fend for herself in men's clothes with no tools and no weapons of any kind. 
and she manages to survive. And then finally, when she discovers her strength and her freedom, she can go back and use women's clothes. I had never thought of that. So now when you ask me what's Daughter of Fortune about, I say feminism. <laughs> but, but that was not my idea. <clears throat> and I have theses, like three or four, about the dog in the House of the Spirits. There was a dog called Barabbas in the House of the Spirits who died uh, murdered by, by a butcher. And th these theses are about what the dog symbolizes, the people oppressed by the military, the male energy in the house, black and big. Or just a dog. We had a dog at home called Barabbas who was killed by the butcher. <laughs> That's it. I'm going to tell my English teacher yeah, that next okay. time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But you know, it's worse for the parents to imagine that the kids do. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> Hi. Um, I had a somewhat more personal question. Um, more personal. Um, you, uh, well, you in a way answered a little bit of it when you said that all your family was here and you didn't like any of your family in Chile, and I, I think a lot of us can relate to not really caring for many of our blood relations. I, I think that's, <laughs> that's pretty common. Um, but nonetheless, you lived in Chile and uh, the United States has, how should we put it, a, a troubled relationship with Chile politically, and I, I often wonder what it must be like for you if you feel in a way like a part of your heart is in Chile or in Chile as it was, if, uh, if it makes you feel conflicted to live in a country that has a negative relationship with Chile and that uh, what so negatively impacted you and people you cared for. Um, it yeah. seems to me it must make, there must be kind of a, I don't know, a sense of division inside. When I came to the United States, I was passing by on a book tour. It was not my idea to live in the United States. I was not chasing the American dream. I didn't even know what that was. And I felt that the United States was my personal enemy because of the intervention of the CIA in the military coup in Chile. On September 11th, 1973, we had a military coup in Chile, which was a terrorist attack on a democracy, propped up and supported by the CIA. The United States has promoted tyrannies and terrible governments and horrible wars all over the world that they would never, never have in this country, I hope. Well, now I'm doubting. Um, so when I came here, I, I, I didn't like this country at all. Now, I, I have lived here for 20 years. I am an American city, citizen, and I do love the United States. I'm very critical, especially of the Bush government. But... Um, But I th think that a country, like a husband, can always be improved. <laughs> uh, and so that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to improve this country in my little, little measure. I I'm that's what I'm trying to do. And I think that that's what we all should try to do. And this is a good opportunity to do it in the next election. Um, I think the world is going in a very bad direction, and we can change it. I don't feel conflicted because I live here and because I am an American citizen and because I love this country. Things have changed in Chile. Things have changed in the world. My country is doing very well. It has a wonderful woman president, Michelle Bachelet. And uh, 30 years have gone by since the military coup and the country is doing well. Uh, and I think that if uh, we, w what happens to me is that I, I make I divide in my head, I separate in my head what the government or the CIA does and the people. Most Americans have no idea what the government does with their money. They have no idea when I go around telling them the things I know, they are horrified. I have found myself sometimes in the most conservative parts of, the, of this country and I tell them about what I have seen in other places. People are horrified. They don't want that. And so I feel that that's my mission. I have to do that. I'm not conflicted.
I suddenly feel very tall. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you had any advice for aspiring writers. Uh, I would say to an aspiring writer that the same thing that I say to my granddaughter Andrea who wants to be a writer, that this is like training for sports. You train every day in order to compete in the game. And if you don't train, you can't compete. You cannot write the great American novel in one sitting, like Willie thinks. <laughs> uh, you train. You write every day at least one good page, which means like 10 bad pages. You, you read a lot. You look for your masters. You read your masters, the, re the people that you like their writing, and study them and see why do you like it? What, how, do they, how do they handle suspense, or rhythm, poetry, um, characters, plot? And, and, and then you, you learn. Then try to participate in as, as many uh, writing classes, contests, whatever. Get involved in the business of writing. Don't think that you can do it alone in the bathroom. It doesn't work. Thank you. And when you get your book done, look for an agent. Another short person. Hola, in the hola. Crowd. Uh, I have a, a, two questions. One is, are the members of your family still talking to each other and you? And my other question is, you've been much more successful than I in being a matchmaker, and after all, I'm Jewish. So instead of, be instead of becoming a dentist, when you're ready, could we think about setting something like that up? I like to work with experts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah my, my family has been very generous to me, and I'm very grateful. I know that it, it is hard for most of you to be exposed. And uh, um, the, the book has been out in Spanish for over a year, and it has, it's number one in many countries. It's been, we are getting a lot of letters. But my, it's right now, only yesterday, out in English. So you have not yet had people come to you and ask you personal questions, and that will start happening. And I'm so sorry you will have to put up with that. <laughs> Uh, but what happens, uh, when, when, I, um, when I wrote Paula first, and then with this book, I, I talked with this with Willie many times, and um, Willie convinced me that it is not by telling that you become vulnerable. What makes you vulnerable is the secrets you keep. And when I share my story and the stories of all of us, I realize that everybody has similar stories. All families are crazy. We all have losses. We all get along sometimes and many times we don't. And, we, and somehow we survive. And so this is what life is about and what families are about. So I, I feel that um, by telling the story, I connect to people. I bring people together. I don't think it separates us. Hi, um, I'm from Talagante. Um, ah, otra chilena. Otra, yeah. Um, my dad's also exiled, and he's now back in Chile. And I just heard you um, talk about how you have no conflict living here in the United States. My dad has never been able, never been able to, I guess, get over everything that happened. And I wanted to know, um, how have you come to deal with everything, and how were you able to love this country and love being uh, an American citizen? I, I think that I have overcome most things, most bad things in my life. Loss, separation, exile, death, writing. Writing is the only way I know of dealing with my demons. And every time I write something, I organize it. In a piece of paper, it's limited, it's contained. And I I see it with a certain distance, and I can deal with it. I understand it. I can accept it. I can, I can um, change in my mind the way I say things. When I, very often, the way we feel in life is the way we talk. When uh, I write, I read a paragraph aloud, and I see that the tone of the, of the paragraph is very somber. And that's not exactly what I want to convey. And I change three adjectives in the paragraph. Not more, three adjectives. And the tone changes. And from being something that pulls you down, 
it becomes something that lightens you up just because you changed a few words. So when I tell my story, I never tell my story in tragic tones. My story is an epic legend. It's a wonderful life. Everything is fantastic. And of course there's tragedy and there's a lot of stuff. Thank, thank God there is because then I have something to talk about and something to tell and something to write. But uh, the way we tell our lives is the way we see our lives. And I don't tell exile and death and all that in a bad tone. It's an experience. And I'm glad I lived it. I'm glad I was there with my daughter when she died. And I, and I carry that in my heart like a treasure. And all that grief is like, a, it's like a sediment in my heart. And all the best stuff grows in that very fertile soil. We will take Hola, three Isabel. more questions. You want to, and three, three more questions. Hola. Hola, Isabel, ¿cómo estás? Hola. Uh, you lived in Venezuela for a while. And I know you had a, it's my understanding that you had a wonderful time living in mm -hmm. Venezuela. Are you planning or you have in mind or ever you have thought about writing something about you experience living in Venezuela? If, if I will write about Venezuela, I wrote a book called Eva Luna, which is a very Venezuelan book. Uh, and I don't know if I will write about that experience, maybe. You know, it takes years and years for something to mature, and then it comes back in different ways. I have great connections with Venezuela. Um, both my children married Venezuelans. I have a brother who lives there, a grandson who was born there, Half of my family, my brother's family, lives in Merida. So um, I have many connections and many good friends, but I, I don't feel like I have a story yet. Maybe in the future. Great. I hope so. Okay, thanks. Hi, Isabel. Hola. Hola. Uh, do you feel that there are themes that are, not, that are not being explored and that are very much needed to be written in Hispanic America? Themes that needs to be that need to be explored. explored. So that so like, that, you mean in literature? In literature, so that in Americans could get, get an idea of who we are. Yeah, I think that we complex. need to write more about women. Uh, <coughs> women in Latin America are very strong, organized. Uh, now more and more they're involved in politics. In Latin America, women are better educated than men. They live longer. They are more healthy. They are more honest, less corrupt, much more interesting and beautiful. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's the case. So I think that uh, more should be told about women. In, in the United States, people have the idea that women in Latin America are submissive and that they are, there is this macho culture that puts them down, which is true, in a, a, apparently. But women are very, very strong. And, and I think that that needs to be conveyed. I write, mo most of my books are about strong women because really I have never met a woman who is not strong. And I look for them, but I, I can't find them. So that's what I think should be explored more. But male writers don't know them. You know, um, most of the great male writers of the boom of Latin American lit literature who were so famous in the 80s, uh, and 70s and 80s, um, belong to a generation that was brought up segregated. They went to boys' schools, girls' schools. Uh, they, 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 they sort of saw women as stereotypes the prostitute, the fiancé, the eternal mother, etc. And they're not, they were not real people. So now that more and more women writers are being published in Latin America, we get more of what women really are. Thank you. And do you think men are capable of writing about women? Yes, of in, course. And by us? We, men way. are capable of, write, sure. of write, writing about women. Uh, Flaubert, uh, with Madame Bovary, and um, I think that women can write about men. I have, I have written about men, and I think that I do a very good job. <laughs> <clears throat> One more question. And then I will sign everything you have, everything, but no dedications, just the signature. I will repeat this in Spanish because Latinos never listen. <laughs> Voy a firmar todo. 
pero sin dedicatoria. Nada para la abuelita en el día de su cumpleaños, no. Okay. Thank you very much for all your books. I've Thank loved you. each and every one. Uh, I would like to know what, what writers you appreciate and uh, particularly what women writers that you read. Look, I, uh, I go very frequently to Book Passage, which is my favorite bookstore and also like an extension of my office. <laughs> and that sort of second home, and there they pick up the books for me before the books are published very often. When they, they get the reader's copies, they select what they think I might like, and they give me piles that I don't even have to pay for, so it's really convenient. <laughs> and I read new writers, young writers, writers from other places, from Canada, from Australia, from wherever, and I get this wonderful new energy of young writers. I can't give you names because every week there is somebody new. And I'm attached to, to Book Passage because I get to be in touch with readers that I would never discover otherwise. Sometimes some of those great books go by anonymously. They, they, I think this is going to be a bestseller. Nobody talks about it. And it's a fantastic book that I have read nine months before because Book Passage selected it for me. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much.